This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us over the Internet from remote outposts around the world. Thank you for being with us again. In just a moment, we'll be speaking with our nation's first Secretary of Homeland Security, Mr. Tom Ridge, about our response to ISIS, the growing threat of cyber attacks, and what we can and should do to protect critical electrical communications and other infrastructure. But before Mr. Ridge joins us, as is my custom every week, let me tell you a little about his background. Thomas Joseph Ridge was born in Munhall, Pennsylvania, the oldest of three children. He grew up in veterans' public housing in Pittsburgh's Steel Valley, owing to his father's service in the Navy. Ridge earned a scholarship to Harvard University and paid his way through school working in construction. Armed with a strong work ethic, he graduated with honors and was accepted to the Dickinson School of Law. His law education was temporarily interrupted when Ridge was drafted into the Army and served in the 23rd Infantry Division in Vietnam. When he returned to Pennsylvania, he completed his law degree and entered private practice prior to becoming the assistant district attorney in Erie County in 1980. Two years later, Ridge ran for and won a seat in the United States Congress and was reelected six times. Then in 1994, Ridge ran for governor of Pennsylvania and prevailed. In 98, he was reelected, breaking all records for a Republican gubernatorial candidate in that state. He served until 2001 when, the uh, following the events of 9-11, President Bush named Ridge to head up the newly created Office of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security consolidated 22 agencies and 180,000 employees into a single agency aimed at protecting the United States from terrorism. Today, Mr. Ridge is the CEO of Ridge Global is a best-selling author, and is active in the Tom Ridge School of Intelligence Studies and Information Science at Mercyhurst University. He continues to work on the forefront of our most important security issues. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report our first United States Secretary of Homeland Security, Mr. Tom Ridge. Welcome to the program, Mr. Ridge. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very warm and lovely introduction, and let me just join you in uh, reaching out and expressing my gratitude, uh, as all 300 million citizens do from time to time, to men and women uh, wearing our uniform both in this country and overseas, uh, doing hard work, but work worth doing. I join you in saluting them, and thank you for the invitation to join you. Absolutely. Uh, We have so many members of our military that join us over the Internet. And uh, I I have to tell you, every week we're very fortunate to hear from them. Uh, And that's where we get a lot of our information. You know, that's a that's one way of confirming what's going on in the ground when you get multiple, uh, you know, stories uh, and they all uh, match up. Then, you know, you kind of get get a a good, clear picture of what's really happening. Now, uh, our president uh, has urged the United Nations countries to join the United States to put a stop to ISIS. And we hear that uh, the government is very busy building a coalition of allies. But um, so far on the surface, the U.S. looks to be doing the majority of the heavy lifting where these actual airstrikes are concerned. So when we talk about allies, are, are we talking about political allies or allies who are willing to commit serious military personnel and equipment to stop ISIS? What's your view on that? Well, I think it's probably a combination of both. I I think uh, allies, and we have varying degrees of relationships, uh, but I think uh, everyone that's in the coalition so far, and I am hopeful that that coalition grows, is connected to the United States in a positive way for many different reasons, and certainly has a shared mutual interest with us uh, to eliminate, uh, not degrade, but to eliminate uh, ISIL that now occupies significant parts of uh, Syria and uh, Iraq. I think at the outset, uh, we are carrying most of the military load. At the outset, Mm -hmm. however, I think it was very, very important, uh, not from just a military point of view, but I also think from a a political point of view, and this this is why it's critically important to have allies from the Middle East, Uh, And so you have Saudi Arabia and you have the Emirates and you have Jordan. Uh, I don't know how many airplanes they got involved and how many how many bombs that they've they've dropped on these targets. But it is a Middle Eastern problem. 
uh, right now could spread metastasize around the globe. It's a, a problem in the Arab world, and it's a problem in the Islamic community. So I think it's very important to the billions of those who practice that religion to see that even those who share that faith uh, take a look at ISIL as uh, being uh, contrary to their uh, basic beliefs. And so I think that, that first group of countries in was very important. I'd like to think in time we're going to have more support uh, from uh, European countries as well, because they are certainly in the crosshairs of any potential terrorist activity from ISIL. Absolutely. Now, you have said that ISIL is not a terrorist organization, that it is a military because it controls territory, has money and sophisticated arms, laws and and so on. Uh, Can you elaborate on that? Yes, well, I'm very pleased to. I think uh, they may see themselves as a caliphate state, but they're not. But we shouldn't. I mean, it's kind of interesting. And again, it's language is so important in this. And I agree with you that that's that's part of the confusion I think the American people are having. It's the language because we if they're not a terrorist organization and yet we describe our actions as a counterterrorism campaign, it's a little confusing. Well, you know, it's amazing. This is the first time we've ever had this conversation. You anticipated the concern I have specifically about classifying it as a counterterrorism operation. This is a significantly well-armed, well-financed, controlling entity that likes to see themselves as a state, but obviously they're not. But they do occupy serious ground, and they are armed to the teeth, uh, probably through international arms dealer and equipment that the Iraqis had and abandoned when they ran away from the fight and some of the Syrians had. So when you think of a counterterrorism operation, you see it with small cells and you bring in special forces and do those kinds of things to eliminate them almost on an ad hoc basis. This is an entity that has uh, thousands of troops deployed across a fairly substantial frontier. It's not a terrorist organization. Uh, and it's, it, it's an army. It's a terrorist army. And uh, to say it's a counterterrorism uh, operation, I believe, is not accurate, and it kind of dumbs down or um, diminishes the severity of the challenge uh, to America and our allies to eliminate them. It's one thing to go in and eliminate a couple of terrorist cells. It's another to eliminate a group that might be as large as 30,000 and perhaps growing every day. Now, Josh Rushing, a reporter, an American reporter with Al Jazeera English, uh, says that he met with one of the Sunni tribal uh, leaders uh, who has about 2 million members in his tribe, uh, of which 600,000 are armed soldiers. So this adds more credence to your comment that this is a military. And as far as they're concerned, they do have a state. Uh, they have uh, borders. They have laws. They have access uh, points that you can come in or can't come in uh, to. Um, they have uh, trade going on uh, within their borders. Um, th- they're acting like a state. They control, I mean, thousands and thousands of square miles. And you've identified in that area, the region, the infrastructure that they have put in place. I mean, the brutality with which they've, uh, they, they uh, oversee some of these villages and communities, the brutality, it's medieval. I mean, crucifying people, beheading people, shooting people in the street, uh, and their ability to, and their use of the social media to kind of project this image that we are fearless, we're barbaric, uh, we don't care what's ever in our way, we will destroy it in order to achieve our goal of this caliphate. Uh, that's, I mean, that's part of their psychological operation, and it probably has had some effect. I mean, certainly the Iraqi soldiers had a lot of reasons to cut and run, not the least of which they weren't particularly loyal to the Maliki government because he wasn't particularly loyal to them. But having said that, you couple that with this, this sense, if I get captured, I'll be killed. And by the way, some were captured and were killed. Uh, so they've, they've, they've helped create this, uh, this, this violent, virulent image of this organization. So it's just mm-hmm. not a kind of an operation. Now we have to uh, take a short break, but stay right where you are. Uh, when we come back, we're going to dispel the myth that there are no U.S. ground troops and everything is done, being done by the air. Uh, you're listening to the Costa Report. No matter what business you're in, what happens in Washington can make the difference between business success or failure. 
That's why understanding where government is headed is so important in today's competitive business environment. But where can you find experts who know firsthand the inner workings of our nation's capital? The American Program Bureau is your leading source for speakers whose experience offer unique insights into where U.S. policy is headed. Speakers like Seth Harris, former acting U.S. Secretary of Labor, Alyssa Mastromonaco, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, and General Carl Eikenberry, former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan. For your next meeting or conference, contact the American Program Bureau at apbspeakers.com or 617-614-1600. That's apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. The body is an electrical system. Every thought we think, eye we blink, move we make, and step we take requires a controlled and powerful burst of electricity. And where does that electrical energy come from? Ultimately, it comes from living or recently living foods, fruits, vegetables, fresh dairy, eggs, meats, and seafood. Unfortunately, most of the foods we subsist on are far from farm fresh. That's because in the food business, there's an antagonistic relationship between energy and economics. High-energy fresh foods are prone to instability, which can be observed as product degradation and breakdown. And this represents a problem. In the food business, there are few considerations more important than shelf life. That's where food processing, which is essentially a technology that eliminates high-energy food molecules, comes in. Food that won't rot or go rancid, and that can be shipped and shelved and sold for profit. On the other hand, because the eliminated unstable compounds represent energy, foods that have been manipulated and mangled in this fashion while being stable for long periods have lost their electrical value. Ninety percent of American calories come from processed foods. The body's an electrical system. Its life force is electrical, and this electrical life energy is ultimately derived from the foods we eat. Processed food, however, has been robbed of the slave force, and while processors are under government mandate to add in some synthetic biomimicking micronutrients, that's called enrichment, if you're looking for a reason for the abysmal state of the health of the American public, you couldn't pick one that's more significant than the fact that most of the food we're eating is electrically empty and essentially dead. Pharmacist Ben here, urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. KSCOHealth.com. That's KSCOHealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to KSCOHealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos, too, at KSCOHealth.com. That's KSCOHealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former governor of Pennsylvania and the first secretary of Homeland Security, Mr. Tom Ridge. And before the break, we were talking about the importance of using the right language when describing ISIL and calling our action a counterterrorism campaign might mislead people to think that we're talking about a few dangerous cells rather than fighting a, a large military. Now, uh, Al Jazeera News it has been reporting for some time that there are, in fact, United States boots on the ground in, in Iraq and Syria. And recently, you seem to confirm the same thing. You've called it fiction to claim that there's no military presence on the ground. Um, if, if this is the case, why, why not be transparent about that fact to the American people? Well, Rebecca, you know, I've, you, you've called uh, something into play that I think is very important for leaders of any organization, 
Uh, I don't care whether you're president of the United States, uh, of a company, a local community. Uh, the facts, uh, Americans uh, need to know. Uh, they're not going to be breathless about the challenges associated with uh, dealing with ISIL. We're a tough, resilient country. And I know the president is trying to do everything he possibly can to suggest he's a wartime president, but they even brought him into using that language, even though they tried not to use it. It was very obviously uncomfortable for them for, for, for several days. But the fact of the matter is that the president has said on many occasions there'll be no boots on the ground. Uh, it reminds me of a political cartoon I saw the other day where uh, a couple of soldiers are taking off their combat boots and putting on golf shoes. Uh, the <laughs> oh, fact no. of the matter is, is that they're not wearing sneakers yeah. or golf shoes. We've got 1,500 men, I presume. Perhaps there's some women over there in strategic roles. And it reminded me of the time I worked with some advisors when my, my unit in Vietnam worked with some, they called it MACV, Military Assistance Command. They were advisors. Yes. What advisors do, they went out and they worked with us. They did operations. Now, now we've got we got General Dempsey backed in a corner saying we're not even going to take our troops out uh, to work on operations. At some point in time, we've got to be realistic. The, the the notion that we can just simply destroy this enemy with drone attacks, with missiles from ships and bombs from airplanes is just contrary to how the war needs to be fought if it, we seek to win it. So at some point in time, let's say we have 15 brave patriots doing their job in very perilous territory. And let's not suggest that somehow we think we can overcome this by equipping 5,000 Syrians and relying on the Peshmerga, the Kurds, and a few others to get the job done. I think we just have to say if the situation arises and we need to put advisors on the ground to help them conduct military operations, it is in America's interest to do so, period. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Straightforward. Uh, I mean, I just, yeah. he's the president. Uh, Americans can deal with that. I know he doesn't want to be viewed as a wartime president, yeah. uh, but uh, he inherited this situation. I still grew up under his watch. Uh, I'm not blaming him for it, but it's there. Accept it as part of your responsibility as commander in chief. Level with the troops, level with America. And I think it'd be a lot easier to get the backing of America, which is exactly what a, 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 a president needs. Well, that's what a, a leader does. A leader gets us to accept the truth. Not, uh, yeah, not to conceal it from us. Um, uh, some of the uh, news bureaus have uh, given reports that the Sunni tribal leaders, uh, who you know, up to eighty or ninety percent of the ISIL uh, uh, membership is really Sunni based, and um, uh, the Sunni tribal leaders who have millions of followers in their tribes. Um, are truly key to stopping this uh, continuation of ISIS. Um, they, they they were promised a, a sharing in the Iraqi new government. Uh, it didn't happen. Most of the Iraqi appointments in the government were Shia. Um, you know, it, 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 there's a feeling that they the, that the Sunni tribal leaders got backed into a corner. Uh, there was no representation for them. And uh, I, I'm wondering, is this a case where? Um, uh, we needed to reach out to those Sunni leaders and uh, and try to orchestrate some kind of uh, dialogue there. Uh, isn't that a, a step that maybe should have been taken before we started these um, these uh, air campaigns? Well, Rebecca, I must say I don't know uh, your source of intelligence, uh, but your assessment of one of the major challenges uh, – uh, that we didn't inherit. In fact, America basically created the estrangement of the Sunnis from the Maliki government that was Shia dominated. His party did not win uh, the most seats in the last election, but for whatever reason, our State Department's worked uh, its way through and got Maliki uh, reasserted as the leader and yes. there his promise, and he's broken. Many, many promises. Perhaps the new uh, president and team will do better. And he but willfully, willfully, uh, not only disengaged himself from some of these Sunni tribal leaders, but was very oppressive against uh, a lot of these Sunni communities. Our media rarely reported it. Our State Department had to know what was going on. Uh, but I think at the time, Tehran had more influence in Baghdad than we did, even though we spent, uh, we lost a lot of uh, blood over there, 4,000 plus men and women and hundreds of billions of dollars. So I think you're onto something that's very important. And this notion that somehow we can reconstitute this army, even under the new uh, leader there, that's going to take an enormous amount of time. So again, we're not quite leveling 
uh, with the, the American people. And frankly, this is a challenge and this is a, a situation that I do lay at the doorstep of the State Department. This is Maliki who ran a very repressive regime. And he promised to be inclusive, and we exerted no pressure on him. None. And at one time, we did have a dialogue with these same Sunni tribal leaders that are, have now yes. joined w- with ISIL. So, you know, it seems to me, and and the reports that come back to us say that the United States has made no effort through the State Department to open up a dialogue with these tribal leaders. If they have, you know, one, one tribe has 600,000 armed soldiers. I mean, it, it's very clear to me that if we were to open up a conversation with them uh, that, uh, you know, much of this could be worked out over time. Again, it would take time. And I'm not saying that the that the um, the air attacks are not necessary. Uh, Maybe one doesn't preclude the other. But it seems odd that we would move to air attacks without opening up a dialogue with actors who we already had a relationship with. Well, your, your, your commentary, I think, is, 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 is very appropriate because we have a history of very positive relationships. So not yes. all of them, I mean, I, I don't think there are that many tribal chiefs that are aligned with ISIL, uh, but they were pretty much ignored them rampaging through some of those communities, more not in support of ISIL, but their total disgust and uh, concern, and uh, it's their way to protest against the uh, Shia-dominated Maliki government. But let's remember how General Petraeus, in General McChrystal is part of the surge in, the, in, in, in around Fallujah and certain parts of Iraq worked with and had tremendous credibility with many of these Sunni tribal leaders, which we, which our country lost when two things happened. Uh, the president uh, did not insist on keeping 20 or 30,000 of our troops there, boots on the ground, to continue to work with the tribal leaders. And I dare say if we had kept those 20 or 30,000 in there, I doubt if ISIL would have... They, they, grown and matured as rapidly and as they have now but we also preserve the kind of relationships about which you just spoke and that is good working relationship based upon mutual interest with tribal leaders in iraq we've got to go back and revisit that and restore confidence and restore credibility because frankly i think we lost it over the past two or three years i i think i'm in you know, i'm in absolute agreement with you i i think that that those leaders would be open to dialogue again, particularly when uh, we worked side by side with them and had such a positive relationship in the past. And now we're going to have to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about cybersecurity with Tom Ridge. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. For 30 years, the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency has worked hard to be an agency delivering answers. PV Water's primary mission is to work collaboratively to protect and sustain the water resources of the Pajaro Valley. The agency is using its three decades of experience to help tackle this unprecedented drought head-on not just with dire warnings, but with practical solutions. On the homepage of the agency's website, pvwater.org, is a link to the newly created Water Conservation Toolkits. These toolkits are filled with resources anyone can utilize to reduce water use while minimizing the impact on comfort, the joy of landscaping, and a bountiful garden. Using water as efficiently as possible helps to protect our precious water resources. The Water Conservation Toolkit and more information on PV Water, an agency delivering answers, is available at pvwater.org. 
From the incomprehensible brogue of the highlands of Scotland, to the scorching sands of the Middle East, to the glitz of West Hollywood, and finally to the hobbit-like atmosphere of the San Lorenzo Valley. This is the story of Rosemary Chalmers, former subject of Her Majesty the Queen. Excitement, excitement, excitement. Becoming a citizen is a wonderful thing, and I'm thrilled to bits, and I would love you all to come and celebrate. We have many invited dignitaries that are coming. The cause, we want to talk about civic-mindedness, and perhaps just pop that thought into your head about what you can do to make your community better. We're celebrating my citizenship this Friday, the 26th of September, from 8 to 9.30 a.m. So come on down to KSCO at 2300 Portola Drive. Have breakfast with us. It's red, white, and blue from 8 a.m. to 9.30. Hula and I hope to see you here. Do you have a plan for your money? Does your money come and go like the tides? Do you just leave your finances to fate? Cash is always flowing. Money is always moving. And if you don't manage it, it will move away from you. So many people actually spend more time planning their next trip to the dentist then they do something even more important, like their retirement. You know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Don't leave your financial future to fate. Take charge. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Money Moves is dedicated to providing you tips and tools so you can manage your own money effectively. No one cares about your money more than you do. Therefore, you need the skills to manage your money. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Tom Ridge. Now, in addition to foreign and physical threats, I know one of the areas that you have voiced concerns over is cybersecurity. You've been active in advising the government on how to protect our electrical grids, and you've also had some concerns about large businesses which have been targets of uh, cyber attacks, such as Home Depot and Target. Can you speak to that for just a moment? Uh, yes, happy to, Rebecca. I, I must say it's very interesting where, where we're going on your show. I have often uh, expressed to friends privately and occasionally publicly there are two permanent uh, changes in the world that I do think affect our social, political, and economic future. One is the global scourge of terrorism. Uh, the threat surface has expanded. The terrorists have expanded. We talked a little bit about part of that before. But the second is the digital forevermore. I mean, when you think about it, uh, the sun is never go- the digital sun is never going to set. The World Wide Web is even going to get bigger. There are 14 billion devices uh, connected to the Internet today. A Forbes magazine said that I think by the end of this decade, it might be as many 40 billion devices. And because of the connectivity, there's so many positive things about that in communication, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But every point of entry is a point of vulnerability. And to that end, uh, the nature of uh, spying among countries has changed. The nature of doing business has changed. And the fact is that companies with proprietary secrets, personal identification information, uh, in all the 16 sectors are vulnerable to attack uh, because even that threat, even the attack surface has changed. You've got nation states and uh, you've got hacktivists. You've got hackers for hire. You've got organized crime. You've got individuals. And it's about theft, it's about espionage, it's about sabotage, it's about mischief, it's about uh, all these. And so it's a different world and particularly concerned about how business until recently is basically looked at as a technology problem. Mm-hmm. And one of the messages we try to uh, reiterate when we talk to clients or this is the general public, it's not a, a technology problem. It is a significant major business risk. Mm-hmm. Ask the folks at Target, ask the folks at Home Depot and Neiman Markets, and there's some defense contractors out there. So we need to wrap our head around this notion that it's a, there's a promise with the Internet and there's a lot of peril and we have to manage that risk. 
Now, you've suggested that there's a gap between government and private businesses in terms of sharing data, um, security data, security tools. And uh, part of that's due to over-restrictive government classifications and regulations, which make it difficult for businesses to get intelligence information, which might help them protect their institutions. But uh, on the other hand, if the government gives greater access to the private sector, doesn't that also open the door to more mischief? Well, you know, Rebecca, first I want to thank you for whoever was some of all that information about you knowing a little bit what I think and what I say. But I have been critical, but hopefully in a constructive way. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we had in the Department of Homeland Security is getting timely and relevant uh, information from the alphabet agencies to shoot down to the governors and to put big city police chiefs and mayors. Yes. So you fast mm-hmm. forward and you fast forward. And I think there's the same problem right now, getting information from the government with regard to cyber attacks down to uh, the private sector. Mm-hmm. 85% of the private sector, 85% of the critical infrastructure in this country upon which the government relies is owned by the private sector. So that I do think we overclassify it or as I said, and I will continue to say, in this new world of the 21st century, whether you're dealing with terrorism or digital attackers, it's no longer a need to know, which was the Cold War mentality. It is now a need to share. And if you can't trust the chief information security officer from the major company or the chief technology officer with that relevant, timely information, who are you going to trust? Yes, and, and there, there does seem to be a gap, doesn't there, between... Uh... In the, the intelligence that the government is collecting on who is uh, performing these cyber attacks and uh, and how they're being performed and the access to th- that kind of information, which will would allow private businesses to act on that, to defend against those kinds of attacks. It is getting better. Mm-hmm. You have to give credit where credit is due. I think depending on who you talk to and in individual communities, uh, you're seeing the alphabet agencies, particularly the FBI, a lot more aggressive reaching out and contacting and sharing information. But depend on whom, with whom you've had the conversation, many of them will say, but we already knew that. Mm. Or they didn't tell us anything that we could that was actionable. So I know there's always a super sensitivity to leaks. But when you're combating terrorists, whether they're the physical kind that you're dealing with ISIL and Al-Qaeda and the rest of them, or the digital terrorists, uh, the trespassers on the Internet, if we cannot trust fellow Americans to use that information, if it's properly given to them, then who are we going to trust? You cannot secure the country from inside the beltway. And everybody, and, uh, everybody needs to understand that. All the allies and the partnerships you have are out in the 50 states and territories. And responsible people in responsible positions should be treated as patriots, not as potential leakers. Now, now the Russians used cyber attacks prior to their actions in Georgia, mm-hmm. and the Chinese military sees cyber attacks as part of an ongoing weapons program. And, and, uh, and you, you've made the comment, which I agree with 100%, that cyber warfare is not a war of the future. It, it's here right now. Absolutely. Um, uh, and I, I agree with that. Uh, now, we have videos on YouTube showing a fellow that uh, used a 3D printer to print a plastic gun that fires three or four rounds. So how long before I can print the parts for more serious weapons at home? But, but how is our government going to stop things like 3D printing of weapons, for example? Well, I think uh, I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to uh, stop that. I mean, you get the government inside. I mean, 3D manufacturing, again, it's the challenge with the Internet about which you and I spoke a few minutes ago. It's so much so many positive things yes. associated with the Internet and the World Wide Web. I mean, just so much good can come out of it. But it is still a perilous network and the enterprises that result from that. So it's a risk that you have to manage and there have to be a lot of very difficult uh, decisions made within the, uh, the political and the corporate community. But it is a manageable risk. And the best way to manage the risk, and I'm talking about attacks on government and attacks on companies, is to get as much information from the government down to the private sector and then to make sure that the private sector – and we've divided, the country's divided into 16 economic sectors, and they have something called the Information Sharing uh, Analysis Centers. They're ISACs for short. Mm-hmm. Uh, the best is the financial services, and most of the others are not terribly mature. But 
they need to be able to share information with one another without being worried about antitrust, about the Justice Department uh, uh, jumping all over them. So at the end of the day, there's got to be that kind of collaboration uh, among our, uh, between government and the private sector to make sure that we reduce the risk of both kinds of attacks. It's interesting, not long ago, I had Vince Cerf, who was one of the actual inventors, not Al Gore, but uh, one of the actual inventors of the Internet uh, when it was a DARPA program. He's uh, now chief scientist and technologist at Google. He was on the program, and uh, ironically, he was in favor of uh, controlling the information on the Internet. He doesn't want it. He doesn't believe it should be turned into the Wild West where uh, you should be able to download um, schematics for missiles. Uh, he feels it's inappropriate, just as, as uh, saying curse words on television and uh, yeah. the radio is inappropriate. He believes that the Internet should have regulations, laws, and then there should be oversight. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I like the idea, but the challenge with the Internet is that it's, uh, it's, it's fairly anonymous and it's worldwide. And I don't know what kind of regulatory scheme you can come up with that people won't violate it. It is a very important public discussion to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the fact of the matter is one of the strengths of the Internet is its ubiquity. It's everywhere. It's one of the weaknesses. It was never designed to be a platform that could be controlled. And uh, the fact is it'll never be able to be controlled. So you might, it is in our best interest. It's like you don't want uh, weapons in the hands of minors. You don't want, you know, there's certain things that uh, consistent with the Constitution uh, that we could do uh, and, and, and protect the privacy and protect rights of individuals and companies. But uh, that, that, that is a regimen in the digital forevermore that we're just scratching the surface is how we can control it and our ability to control it. Uh, and he's a brilliant man, and perhaps uh, he has some just suggestions. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't have those brains to tell you how you can do it. <laughs> well, neither do I. I. In fact, uh, yeah, in fact, in talking to him, I was, uh, my biggest fear was that he would just run away and lose me <laughs> in the technology cyber world. Now, we're going to have to take our final break, but stay right where you are. We'll be back to talk about the Tom Ridge School of Intelligence Studies and Information Science. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, big data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, and I have a question for you, Scott. What goes into making Method Champenois Bubble? You know, it's a process that's really defined by the French government that we've taken and enacted into our wines, which really drive the quality of our sparkling project. So this is a process that the French government defines pretty specifically, and you remain faithful to that. Yeah, 100%, and in some places we push it a little bit. Now, how do the bubbles translate on the palate? You know, it really gives you that vehicle, that mousse for the character of the sparkling wine, carrying the fruit and the complexity. It's the expression of the wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, come taste the difference. Come to Watsonville and look at that. Folks, Michael Olson here. It is a beautiful day down here in Watsonville. I'm at Marty Frannich Ford Lincoln. And right here in front of me out on the lot is something new I've never seen before. And it is hot. Rocky, what is it? Michael, I'm excited to tell all the listeners that's the new Lincoln MKC. It's a new, smaller SUV with the Lincoln brand name on it. 
And it's got many, many class exclusive features such as an active shutter grill. It's got push button shift. It's just something people have to come down and see for themselves. And don't forget to ask the folks at Marty Frannich Ford Lincoln about the 0% financing for 60 months on 2014 Lincoln MKX, MKZ, MKZ Hybrid, and Navigator models. I like to remind people that we're the exclusive Lincoln dealer for Santa Cruz County now. We've got these new Lincoln MKCs, and they're priced right and ready to roll at Marty Frannich Ford Lincoln in Watsonville. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home, not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Join me for It's a Question of Balance with Ruth Copland on Saturday evening, 8 till 10. My in-depth arts interview is with award-winning graphic novel writer and academic Jean Luen Yang. In the Out and About feature, we ask, should happiness be the goal of life? I talk to Professor Galindo, author of Non-Pursuit of Happiness, and interview local people for their opinions. Join me Saturday evening, 8 till 10 on AM 1080 or ksco.com live stream. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Tom Ridge. Uh, Mr. Ridge, you you mentioned that uh, in addition to the uh, digital age that we're going to have to contend with, we're also dealing with the globalization of terrorism. Uh, It's not just ISIS. Uh, We have the conflict between Hamas and Israel, Boko Haram in uh, Nigeria, problems in the Ukraine, North Korea and Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions, and the list goes on. Um, uh, What do you say to listeners who... Uh, feel that we just can't afford to act as the police force of the world, and we keep getting drug into these uh, these situations. Well, uh, that's a good, I want to answer that question. I would I want to correct something I said earlier about the digital age. Because some of Pennsylvanians are listening to the show. Uh, I don't worry about firearms in the arms, firearms in the hands of uh, minors or children. I got thousands of kids in Pennsylvania with the supervision, moms and dads. But we don't need this 3D printing, given the capability of terrorists and anarchists and, uh, and, and criminals. I just wanted to correct that. I misspoke earlier. But the th- yeah, no, absolutely. I and uh, you know I, I, when I when you look at this video, it's uh, and I encourage everybody to go just go on youtube it's yep. daunting that this guy creates a plastic gun and goes out in his backyard yep. and shoots it and then you know i'm in washington dc and they say well you know we've got to change uh, gun laws and i said well you're a little bit behind when yeah. you well, you know the gun laws are irrelevant when you can print a plastic gun at home on your printer so you know i, I again the, it's the technology it's the internet it seems to be moving uh, much faster than we can get Regu- you know, our laws and regulations and even grasp the concept of it sometimes, I, I think. Exactly. I, and I thank you for letting me make the correction, but I'll just put an exclamation point on what you said. The digital forevermore and the improvements in technology is moving much, much faster at warp speed compared to our political system. And until somebody really sits down and thinks about this in a, in a very serious way, hopefully in a bipartisan way, it's, it's, it, it is a risk to our national security, it's a risk to our economic security, and the few opportunities that that the Congress has had and the president have had to try to work with the private sector. They made only modest, I mean, tiny steps in that direction. It's about time that uh, they understood the seriousness and the severity of the consequences that they don't deal with more appropriately. Well, no, they need to, they need you to, they need to bring you back in so you can uh, move this process along, Mr. Ridge. <laughs> well, Rebecca, you're, you're concerned and some of your listeners have about being the police in the world. That's right. I mean, I think, uh, uh, we have to be very careful when we uh, intervene with our military. Um, uh, we need to be very careful about how the form of our engagement. But we, uh, what we've had in a post-9/11 world, and and I think it's as strong as today, and maybe even better, is the collaboration and communication between law enforcement and the intelligence community. Uh, that has to continue to be a high priority. Mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges going forward, and you mentioned some of these, is, again, I, mean, I just don't want to 
you sound so critical, but when, when bin Laden was killed, the administration said we got Al Qaeda on the run. I mean, that's such a horrible misstatement. Politically self-serving, you know, they're on the run. They're they're getting bigger and they're growing elsewhere. So I mean, just the American public needs to understand. We don't have to be afraid of this, but it is a it is something we're going to be dealing with. So let's be straightforward. I think one of the biggest challenges right now going forward is how we deal with Iran. If you look at that instability. In the Middle East, which you got Hezbollah, you got Hamas, you got the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, you got Al Qaeda cells, and just about everywhere you look, uh, you can find the tentacles of uh, the mullahs and uh, Iran. And uh, I think the president has to proceed very, very carefully. They made a very appropriate decision not to deal with Iran and dealing and trying to uh, defeat ISIL. Mm-hmm. Uh, the enemy of my enemy is still my enemy. They will never be. They are not our friends, and they've been demonstrated over the past three or four years. They've kept the Western world talking, and they've built more centrifuges. So I think dealing with Iran in a more direct way helps mitigate uh, some of that threat. But again, it is a global surge. It's uh, not going away, and uh, we're just going to have to deal with it selectively with military, comprehensively with intelligence and law enforcement, and keep maintaining a strong and vigilant uh, defense here at home. Well, I'll tell you, you and I could do a whole show on just our relationship with Iran, uh, with the new leadership in Iran. They seem Anytime. seem to be uh, exercising great restraint relative to the uh, recent uh, conflict between Israel and Hamas, where they, you know, were were never uh, conservative about jumping in. Uh, to, uh, you know, show uh, how Israel was uh, attacking Hamas. In this particular case, they showed a great deal of public restraint. And uh, that may, hopefully, that may be a sign that, uh, you know, that they are uh, understanding that Israel is an important ally of the United States. Now, before we run out of time, I do want to ask you about the Tom Ridge School of Intelligence Studies and Information Science at Mercyhurst University. Um, That is a program that's uh, helping to prepare future generations uh, to uh, deal with a, a, a different kind of world. And I'd like you to talk about that if you have a moment. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, proud of this jewel of a school in my hometown of Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, For whatever reason, they've been kind enough to uh, try to build a library based on some records as governor's Homeland Security Secretary. But long before that, they began this program of intelligence analysis. And and, 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 uh, it's very unique uh, because they train these men and women. They've got an undergraduate and graduate program it, it's it, it's it's creating an ability to uh, look at uh, information, uh, analyze information, and uh, uh, concisely analyze it and create options for decision makers. Whether it's uh, uh, one of the alphabet agencies, and if you're analyzing threat information, uh, but it's a it's a capacity, it's an approach to analyzing information that could be applied in the corporate uh, boardroom as well or with nonprofits. So it's a it's a fascinating. Uh, uh, way to look at the world, and it's creating a capacity with some very talented, smart young people to be able to make a real contribution to their government, uh, to uh, the private sector, uh, to uh, uh, synthesize, analyze, reduce it to the most important features, and help decision makers based on the analysis. Uh, create options for uh, further action. It's a, it's a great program. Everybody that goes through the program, uh, I think the last month, everybody that walks out the degree also walks out with a job offer too. So it's a, again, it's the way of the world, 21st century, the information age, big data. Who's going to take a look at all that information? Who's going to synthesize it? Who's going to analyze it? And who's going to make some recommendations for action? Uh, and that's why I'm very proud to be associated with it. Well, you should be very proud. I've taken time to investigate the program myself. It's a wonderful program, and it does help to prepare future generations to look after the uh, security of our country and also of businesses as well. Unfortunately, Mr. Ridge, we are out of time for today, but before we say goodbye, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Ridge. I've been privileged to serve it, as so many others have, and thank you for the opportunity to spend this time with you and your audience talking two very important subjects. Global thank you so much. You, the digital forevermore. Thank you, you Rebecca, you, very much. You come back very soon. Thank you.
If your station is leaving us after this first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Tom Ridge today, take a moment to email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Is the conflict with ISIS or ISIL a a counterterrorism action or is it war? What do you think? According to Ridge, ISIS is not a terrorist organization. They're a military. And, And in my view, that changes everything. More importantly, are you worried about our country's ability to safeguard against cyber attacks? How safe are our financial institutions or electric power grids? And should the government be sharing more information about how cyber terrorists operate with private businesses in the United States so they can arm their institutions better? Ridge says yes. What do you think? If you missed the full interview with Ridge today or any of our other guests, remember that you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. And while you're at our website, take a moment to check out the book, The Watchman's Rattle. It's available in hard copy, paperback, audio format, and also as an ebook. So no matter how you like to read, we have it in that format, and it takes less than a minute to order. The Watchman's Rattle explains for the very first time why the growing complexity of data, processes, and the decisions that we must make lead to an over-reliance on unproven beliefs and opinions rather than empirical facts. In the blink of an eye, we're suddenly engaging in revisionist history, putting politics ahead of the greater good of society, and following down a dangerous path of irrational policy. It's, it's a pattern of behavior that's haunted us throughout human history. You heard a little about my guest next week during our interview with the Tom Ridge. Acclaimed investigative journalist for Al Jazeera, Josh Rushing, will be here to give us an up-close and personal look at the barbaric aggression of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, better known as ISIS. He'll also confirm that there are U.S. boots on the ground in Iraq and Syria. Don't miss Josh Rushing next week on the only weekly news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouthwatering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. They say you'll never get a second chance to make a good first impression. Hello, I'm Lisa Sabini from Floors Etc. in Soquel. Floors Etc. will help you make a good first impression at your home or business with our incredible selection of carpet, vinyl, hardwood, linoleum, and window coverings. Listen. Hi, I'm Jack Crawford with Music Now DJs. My job is to provide music and entertainment for weddings, corporate, and special events. I'm a professional, so when it comes to my floors, I've been calling on the professionals at Floors Etc. for over 15 years. They're reliable, they're efficient, and their prices are always reasonable. Floors Etc. will help you make a good first impression at your home or business with our incredible selection of carpet, vinyl, hardwood, linoleum, and window coverings. Stop by Floors Etc.'s beautiful showroom and get to know us. When you need to make a good first impression, start at Floors Etc. 3155 Porter Street, SoCal, 462-5586. Surfing Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz.
This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome back to the second hour of the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and during the first hour, we spoke with our country's very first Secretary of Homeland Security following the attacks of 9-11, who was also a very popular two-term governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, Tom Ridge uh, has been very forthcoming when it comes to speaking about the danger uh, dangers that movements such as ISIS pose to the United States. And he's indicated, for the most part, he agrees with Mr. Obama's approach in terms of building consensus among a strong group of allies. Um, yes, if we can build that consensus, that's something that we definitely should do. Um, that leaves a couple of questions for me. Uh, what happens if uh, we don't build uh, an alliance or a coalition or the coalition is small? Um, and uh, was it really necessary to move to airstrikes before we engaged the uh, Sunni tribal leaders who were once uh, great allies and great partners and with whom uh, had a uh, very good and strong working relationship uh, with the United States? With these, uh, you all know that I'm a sociobiologist. I tend to look at these kinds of conflicts very differently. Um, And uh, with these recent beheadings, there's no question that we are testing the limits of barbaric behavior amongst human beings. Uh, The reasons behind the beheadings hardly matter to me. Um, like infanticide or genocide or torture, there there are just some behaviors to which we, as a collective species here on Earth, cannot sink. These are the behaviors of lower animals, organisms which uh, have not evolved this magnificent and in many ways miraculous frontal cortex, um, that marvelous CEO of our brain which allows logical thinking to uh, rule over uh, otherwise prehistoric emotions. And, and you'll notice I said rule over these prehistoric emotions. Um, there, there's nothing we can do to get rid of temptations, em, uh, primitive emotions. I mean, violence is uh, part and parcel of our DNA. Uh, violence is there for a reason. And that reason is very simply self-preservation uh, when we feel we are being attacked. Um, just tr- all you have to do is try to take a young child away from a mother or enter a stranger's house in the middle of the night, and you'll you'll see how strong that instinct is even today. Uh, but left unchecked, these emotions lead to opening gunfire in a crowded theater or a school. Left unchecked, we grab a human who has a different passport from our own, and we cut their heads off. Left unchecked, all of humanity descends into animal behavior unfit for such an evolved and advanced creature. Uh, We are a miracle of biology. It is inconceivable that over hundreds of millions of years, we could evolve such a magnificent brain. And that brain could regulate undesirable behaviors and give us the talent to build spaceships to travel to the moon and vaccines to prevent uh, a child from being paralyzed for their entire life. It is because of the prefrontal cortex that we have become civilized. And it is because of the prefrontal cortex that we can resist temptations such as infidelity or eating donuts all day or screaming at our bosses when we're angry with a decision they've made. And when we use that wonderful, powerful part of the human brain that was millions of years in the making, we will have the rational society that we dream of, one where we're no longer threatened by our animal nature. This is the pathway to stability and peace. But it may not be economic, political, or even military in nature. That pathway has more to do with understanding how humans are hardwired to behave at this particular moment in time. We're born trapped in a biological spacesuit, which has programming which was once essential to our existence, and which too often gets in our way today. Ask the members of ISIS, and they feel that they are doing what they must do 
to become an Islamic state, to create a territory, a safe haven for their troop. They feel the beheadings are needed as a, as a demonstration of power to signal to the rest of the industrialized world that there's no limit to how far they'll go to instill fear and apprehension in those who would oppose them. And to some extent, they've succeeded. A body without a head is the stuff of horror movies. Watching a head be removed from the body is a level of violence which most of us can't stomach, and nor should we. Despite their agenda and convictions, the beheadings have done nothing but solidify the resolve of that portion of humanity which wishes for humankind to choose the higher instruments of our genetic inheritance. And the irony is, and and there is an irony, we're going to have to use violence to get there. Bombs are no less backwards than beheadings. But in this case, the ends may justify the means. Now remember, I said may. Few modern wars have produced the promised results. Very few. And so while we step down this path, this slippery slope, we should be aware that each and every time we've engaged in violent conflict, the results have never materialized that we hoped for. On that note, we're going to have to take a short break to do a little business. And when we return, Sam Quentin and Bill Graff will join me in our weekly roundtable discussion. And you know, based on what you've heard to this point in time, we're really going to mix it up today. <laughs> You're listening to the Costa Report. Mm-hmm. 